Uh, today we're going to continue our discussion of MHC and MHC restriction. So if you remember last time I told you about how T cells don't recognize free antigen, they instead recognize antigen that is being presented by an MHC molecule. You will, or you should know from here on, immunologists get a little bit picky about the word presentation. If you say that the antigen is presented, if you ever write that, I assume you mean on MHC. Whenever I hear the word presented, I assume MHC is involved. And so I didn't tell you that before exam one because you didn't even know what MHC was yet, so I couldn't exactly ding you for talking about MHC when you hadn't learned what MHC was yet. Um, but now as we're learning more about it, um, presentation pretty specifically always means MHC. And so here you can see antigen X being presented by this MHC molecule to a T cell receptor. The T cell receptor is unable to recognize this complex if the MHC, the host uh, part of this, is not matching or if the peptide, the antigen, is not matching, um, which is the way that we usually think about things in B cells. But here we have this host component that's important for recognition as well. A big part of what I want to talk about today is the specifics of the structure of MHC um, and how that relates to the MHC function. But before I do that, I need to talk a little bit about MHC genetics and some MHC nomenclature. And I specifically do not do this in the lecture immediately before the exam because I don't want to give you a headache right before the exam. Um, so the MHC genetics is really interesting. And also, this is one of those places where immunology nomenclature is a little bit obnoxious. The reason for this is that multiple different investigators were studying these processes that we're going to see today in different systems, and they didn't realize they were studying the same thing. And so they all put together sort of this model for what they were seeing um, and only later realized it was the same thing and sort of tried to make the nomenclature go together. In general, all of these proteins that we're talking about today are, of course, known as the MHC proteins. And MHC stands for major histocompatibility complex. These are important for histocompatibility, otherwise known as things like transplant um, reactions. And so this is the general overriding name for the things that we are talking about right now. However, the people who discovered these proteins in humans and in mice did them in totally different routes, totally different types of experiments. And so the nomenclature for human MHC and the nomenclature for mouse MHC are different. When we talk specifically about human MHC, um, we talk about something called the HLA complex. And I'll talk a little bit more about HLA complex on the next slide. One thing that you can notice here comparing the human and the mouse is that in both cases, there is a class one region, which is shown in pink. In both cases, there's a class two region shown in blue. In both cases, there's that class three region shown in green. They're both very long uh, stretches of genetic material. A lot of things about them are going to be pretty similar, but unfortunately, the naming is not one of them. So in human, there were some investigators who were just doing some experiments with human cells. And they found that women who had been pregnant made these interesting antibodies sometimes against this mystery antigen. We now know that it was against the HLAs that were different of their fetus. And so they could sort of do these fun experiments where they could just classify people based on this mystery antigen. It was in humans, 
it was an antigen, and it was on leukocytes. As a result, they called it the human leukocyte antigen. or the HLA. So HLA is the specific name for human MHC. There are three different major uh, human class one molecules. They are HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C. So those are the human class ones. The human class twos are HLA-DP, HLA-DQ, HLA-DR. And you can see the arrangement of those genes here. Here's A, B, and C. Here are uh, DQ, DR, and DP. One thing I want you to notice here that will become important a little bit later, notice that when we look at A, B, and C, our MHC class 1 molecules, there is one A gene on this chromosome. There is one B gene on this chromosome. There is one C gene on this chromosome. DR has two parts. DQ has two parts. DP has two parts. That will make more sense later, but notice it now as well. We talked last time about the fact that MHC genes are the most polymorphic genes in the human genome. So there are many versions of HLA-A. There are many versions of HLA-B. You each have some version of HLA-A that you got from your mom, some version of HLA-A that you got from your dad. The way we distinguish those versions in humans is with the use of numbers. So you might have HLA-A1 and HLA-A17. And we just use different numbers. Sometimes you'll see a number and a star and a, another number. That's because we realized that there were actually more than one thing uh, within the, the type we originally thought of. Um, but we still use just numbers to differentiate the different versions of HLA-A, the different alleles of HLA-A the different alleles of HLA-B, the different alleles of HLA-C. So this part is pretty straightforward. However, people did these experiments in a slightly different manner in mice. In mice, these experiments that discovered the mouse MHC were all done based on skin grafts between different mice. And if you think about it, random antigen from pregnant women and mouse skin grafts would be not be necessarily things you'd ever say, oh yeah, we're studying the same gene. We should keep the nomenclature constant between these two systems because they're clearly the same. Um, there's no reason necessarily you would think these were the same. Um, I will also tell you that I have a friend who is not an immunologist who whenever I start talking about this, uh, he's like, oh right, so um, the major in major incomprehensibility complex, right, that, because um, he finds this nomenclature a little nutty. Um, and these were the types of experiments that were first done to understand this in mouse. So in mouse, we had parents that were part of our inbred strains of mice. One of them you can see here is shown as having two chromosomes that have the letter B. It's also orange. You can also see one parent that has two copies of chromosome K. It's yellow. And we can have a progeny mouse that has one copy of the B chromosome, one copy of the K chromosome. It's both orange and yellow. Here it is stripy. <laughs> the original skin grafting experiments that were done looked something like this. First, they would take one mouse, who was perhaps the parent, and they would try to use that mouse as a skin graft donor to others of that same strain to 
the other parental strain, which is totally different, and to the progeny. And what they could see was that this BB parent, this orange parent, could donate to another mouse of strain orange. Could, this BB parent could not donate to strain, uh, the yellow strain. I mean, they could donate, but the, the uh, transplant would get rejected. Um, and in fact, we could also see donation to the progeny. The same kind of phenomenon was seen with the K parent. The K parent could give to another K mouse. It could not give to a B mouse, and it could give to the progeny. Uh, here, we could look at the progeny. The progeny could not give skin to either parents, but could give skin to another BK mouse. And so what they were able to see is that to be a recipient of the skin, you had to have the MHC type, the MHC chromosome uh, from the recipient. So here, this BK progeny has a B, so it can accept B skin from its B parent. Here, it has K, it can accept K from its K parent. This person, this one, this orange mouse, it does not have K. So it cannot accept a K transplant. The one that does have K can accept a K transplant. Here, this one has B and K. This orange mouse does not have B and K, it only has B. So it cannot accept. This one has just K, so it cannot accept B and K. Only this other progeny could accept B and K. So these types of experiments were done over and over and over again in order to start to characterize the mouse MHC locus. The mouse MHC locus was also named the H2 locus. And I could sit here and I could give you different species and their name of MHC. So for example, uh, Reese's macaque is, the, is MAMU. Um, so they have MAMU A1 instead of HLA A1. It's just a shortened version of Macaca mulata, um, the genus and species name. So there's just some spe special name for the MHC of each species. In the case of mouse, it's H2. And it's really because they were studying histocompatibility that they got really into the H to name this the H2 locus. Mice also have some class 1 genes and some class 2 genes. Instead of having HLA-A, B, and C, mice have H2K, H2D, and H2L. Um, and instead of having DP, DQ, and DR as their class 2s, mice have H2IA and H2IE. They only have the two of them. They don't have three different kinds. You will notice that happily, the class ones still have one letter. The class twos still have two letters. Um, you will also notice, I'm, I will probably mess this up and we'll forget to write H2 in front of a K sometimes and we'll just write K. But if you always remember to write this in front of it, that reminds you, oh right, mouse MHC, <laughs> um, really easily. The reason why we're sort of belaboring some of this, just so you know, is it will show up. I will use the correct nomenclature for things on exam questions and on practice questions. And so you're going to see this and have to be able to handle this nomenclature as you're seeing questions. So this seems pretty straightforward, seems to make sense. The place where things get difficult with the mouse MHC nomenclature is in the way we name the different versions. So with humans, I said that we have HLA-A1 versus HLA-A2. Unfortunately, mice do not have H2K1 versus H2K2, because that would be just too simple. Instead, there is a whole other way they are distinguished. Once upon a time, 
a long, long time ago. I don't know how long ago, but a long, long time ago. People started examining certain types of frequently used inbred mice. One of the first ones that people examined was the C57 black six mouse, um, which is shown in the top. People sometimes call it black six or B6. If you've ever heard of those before, that's what that is. And so they examined that mouse. It had a chromosome from its mom. It had a chromosome from its dad. It had a K, D, and an L on each of them, as well as an IA and an IE. And this mouse was inbred. It's part of an inbred strain. So in fact, the chromosome that it got from its mom and the chromosome that it got from its dad were identical. Sort of like those mice you saw before that had B and B chromosomes, or K and K. This mouse had two identical chromosomes. So in fact, this version of IA is the same one as this one. And this IE is the same as this. And somebody went through and just gave these names. They called the version of IA that the black six mouse has IA of B. They called the IE, IE of B, K of B, D of B, L of B. And so they gave them instead superscript letters to just indicate which version. And so you can see that here that the black six mouse has the B version of all of these different genes. Because all of these genes are the B version, we can actually also name this chromosome. This chromosome is an H2B chromosome. Because every single version of the MHC that are, is on this chromosome is the B type. So black six mice have H2B MHCs. We can also look at another mouse called the Belb C mouse. It's the one that's shown in the upper left here. That's the type of mice we used in our lab earlier. That mouse has a chromosome from its mom and its dad. One thing that is not really well depicted here that I don't want to deal with right now is that some mice don't have um, L. Some mice don't have H2L. But we don't care right now. That's why L isn't shown up there. Um, so somebody looked at the versions of these genes that were in the Belb C mouse, and because why not, they called them all the D versions. So this mouse has IA of D, IE of D, K of D, D of D, L of D, all the way across. And you can see that is listed here as well. The, the Belb C mouse has the D alleles all the way across. And so this is how the different versions of the mouse MHC are named, why these superscripts the Balb C mouse is of the H2D haplotype. And so if you ever see me tell you that such and such mouse is H2B, what that means is you can expand it out to this and know that you get to put a little B next to all of the alleles. Or if it was D, you get to put a D next to all of the alleles. There are other situations that can happen. If our Balb C mouse and our Black 6 mouse have progeny, Say the dad of, is black six, the mom is Belb, then in fact, this mouse would have one chromosome with all the B versions, one chromosome with all the D versions. Um, officially, it's known as H2BD, um, although that I would basically write out for you, or I would tell you it was the progeny of a B and a D, and you could figure out the, what that would look like. 
Um, there are other cases where you can't as easily give a name to the haplotype. So here you can see this B10A for our mouse has the K versions of some of our MHC genes and the B version of others. And these are just in mouse strains. The other thing that sometimes helps, e this either really helps people understand this or really doesn't. So for those of you who it really helps, I will show it. If you decided to spend your fall break this upcoming weekend in the city and you went to the subway and you caught a mouse, that's a wild mouse. It is not an inbred strain, it's just some wild mouse. It would have a chromosome from its mom and a chromosome from its dad. It would have K, D, and L. It would have IA and IE. But it would probably, because it's an outbred mouse, have a mixture of the different types of these genes. So we named the ones that are in the black six mouse the B versions. We named the ones that are in the Balbsee mouse the D versions because we study them a lot. That's just what we called them because we did. But this mouse might have IE of D, or sorry, IA, IA of D, and IA of W, and IE of K, and IE of D, and K of B, and K of L, and D of D, and D of B, and L of W, and L of K. Like it might be totally mixed because this is an outbred wild mouse. And so all this is telling us is which version of K is this? It's the L version. Which version of K is this? It's the B version. We're just using these superscripts to tell us which version. Just like in humans, we're using one or two or three to tell us which allele, which version. With this mouse, I could never give you a general name for its whole uh, haplotype for its HLA because it's all messy. Um, and so this type of nomenclature is something that you will see frequently um, as we move forward with MHC and with T cells. But the other big thing that we need to think about quite a bit is MHC's, the function of MHC and the structure of its MHC. Thus far, I have told you that the overall function of MHC is to bind to peptides from a pathogen that have been broken down, present them on the surface of a cell uh, such that T cells are able to recognize. And we specifically have seen that these uh, peptides, which are in this case the epitope from the pathogen, the epitope here is going to be a string of amino acids that are together as part of the primary sequence. They are not going to be something that's made up of a folded conformation, and they could be anywhere in the, surf in the sequence of this uh, protein, they don't have to be on the outside. So here you can see a linear sequence of amino acids in the middle, probably never get bound by antibodies, but when it's proteolized in the cell, this piece um, becomes available to sit in the MHC and be presented to the T cell. I told you last time that all of our different variants of MHC vary in that peptide binding cleft, which is the region here that's shown in red, uh, or it's on the pink dots in this version from your textbook, which are the same places where we see high levels of amino acid variability. The variability is in the peptide binding cleft, so that each different MHC molecule is going to be able to bind to different epitope peptides. This was sort of the broad stroke stuff I told you last time. But some of you came up after class with some really great questions. And all of those questions are questions that I can only answer um, by breaking this down a little bit more. Because the reason why I am so vague with these types of things is that a lot of the other details of this vary 
when we're talking about MHC class 1 or MHC class 2. And so to fully understand and answer some of the questions that you guys have, we have to actually talk about the specifics of the structures of class 1 versus class 2 and how they are unique in binding to um, peptides and working with peptides. So these are the two general structures of MHC class 1 and MHC class 2. And you will see much more about them as we move forward. Before I tell you about the specifics of peptide binding of MHC class 1 and MHC class 2, there is one other thing that I need to remind you. Those of you who are in biochem may now snicker that I am spending my time reminding you of this. But I have to. <laughs> um, and specifically, the things that I want to remind you about are the details of peptides and how amino acids come together to bind proteins. So you can see an amino acid. Um, actually, you can see two amino acids up at the top. You can see that they have the NH3, or amine, group on one end and a carboxyl group on the other end. So we can talk about the N terminus. We can talk about the C terminus of a peptide. The N terminus is usually positively charged, as you can see here, because it picks up an extra proton. The C terminus is usually negatively charged. You will notice that our amino acids look the same, except for these groups called the R groups, R1 and R2. We will eventually get a peptide bond where our carboxyl group of one amino acid will bind to the amino group of another amino acid, and we'll just keep doing that over and over and over again. I am going to sometimes refer to the backbone atoms or the main chain atoms. When I talk about that, I mean this line of nitrogens and carbons. That's the main chain or the backbone. So we're going to see in some cases that the main chain or the backbone is important. Sometimes we're going to see that our positive charge from the nitrogen is important. Sometimes our negative charge from the carboxyl group is going to be important. But the other thing that is also important is the R group. The amino acids vary based on their R group. And these are the R groups of different amino acids shown here. No, you do not have to memorize them. But there are a couple of things I want you to notice about them. First, notice that they can be grouped into things like charged amino acids versus hydrophobic amino acids. Notice that there are big differences in the size of the R group in addition to the charge, um, and the shapes of the R group. And so we can also think about, in a couple of cases, we're going to care a lot about the unique R groups and it's their sizes and shapes. So this is sort of what that variation looks like as well. Um, the MHC class 1 genes are encoded in the MHC class 1 region of the MHC locus. I know that was really obvious. Um, and as you notice, again, I'll point out that the MHC class 1 genes, HLA A, B, and C, or H2, K, D, and L, each are only shown as having one different piece to them. That one piece has a structure that basically looks like this. The MHC class 1 molecule is made up of a heavy chain and a light chain. And that one piece, that one gene that's encoded in the MHC region is the heavy chain. That's the part that varies in MHC class 1. So that pink gene, oops, this HLAA, for example, that's listed right here, that encodes. this entire section of the protein. This section of the protein has three different domains with a couple of things that are uh, important. So 
First, you can see that there is a transmembrane domain, as well as two other parts at the top. So we have a transmembrane domain. And we basically have a molecule that looks something like this. There is a domain known as alpha 1, domain alpha 2, and a domain alpha 3. Alpha 3 is an immunoglobulin domain. Um, this is a specific immunoglobulin domain. It has a transmembrane domain. And then alpha 1 and alpha 2 are not structured as typical immunoglobulin domains. They are further away from the membrane. And they together make up the peptide binding groove. So the peptide is going to bind here. Alpha 1 and alpha 2, as you can see here, are basically alpha helices. And they are supported on like a platform by some beta sheets of the other domains. This molecule folds together with an additional partner protein. This protein is the same for every MHC you have, for every MHC plus one you have. You just make a ton of copies of this protein and use it over and over and over again. This protein is called beta-2 microglobulin, or beta-2M. It also has the form of an immunoglobulin domain. Notice that it is not covalently linked to the heavy chain, nor does it have a transmembrane domain. It's just this additional non-covalent interacting partner for beta-2M. And so you can see, again, all of this in cartoon form on the slide as well, where we can see class 1 with its heavy chain and beta-2M. You can see alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3, same thing, beta-2M, peptide binding groove, same thing in ribbon diagram here. So this is our MHC class 1 molecule. Um, if we now pivot and look down at the MHC class 1 molecule, we can look at the peptide binding groove in a little bit more detail. The MHC peptide, class 1 peptide binding groove has a few specific features. I really like this version of it from an old view of your textbook because I think it shows actually the thing I want to show the most, um, which is that the ends are closed. These two alpha helices that are giving us a peptide binding groove come together really tightly at the end. The peptide can't like flap out the sides. It's very tight in terms of the length of peptide that it can hold. And so the MHC class 1 peptide binding groove can only hold a peptide of a length of 8 to 10 amino acids. That peptide binding groove is made of an alpha helix from the alpha 1 domain and an alpha helix from the alpha 2 domain. And you can see that peptide interacting with our helix here and here. And you can also see it in a space filling model here. So that part is really important. Um, but there's one other part that's really, really critical for the MHC class 1 peptide binding cleft. And so this is often how I draw a peptide binding cleft. I spent much of my time in graduate school, all of my time in graduate school, working on um, T cells that interact with MHC class 1. So in my head, when I think of MHC, I think of class 1. I draw it like this. Notice that the ends are closed. The peptide can't get too long because <laughs> there's ends here. Um, this part actually is usually pretty negatively charged. This part is usually pretty positively charged. And that's pretty nice because the NH3, which is positive, will want to bind to that negative charge. The carboxyl group that's negatively charged will want to bind to this positive. So that works pretty well. Um, but the other thing that's really important about this peptide binding cleft is that it has a specific pocket shape. And as a result, 
the MHC class one peptide binding cleft is going to be able to interact with different R groups of different peptides. And so for example, this MHC class one peptide binding cleft might only bind to say a lysine that has a long um, R group, or perhaps my, ooh, it's a very narrow thing, but that's okay, I can draw a narrow tyrosine. <laughs> Um, and so be, our peptide binding cleft is going to be specific for amino acids, and we're going to see interactions, these dotted blue lines here are between the R groups and different parts of the peptide binding cleft. This yellow and black part is the main chain, and there are no dotty blue lines. It's not interacting with anything. The only interactions that we see between this peptide and the the cleft are R group interactions. As a result, we can see specific residues, as I've told you before, that are really important for helping that peptide interact with an MHC molecule. Um, these are known in the case of MHC class one as the anchor residues. And so here in my little drawing, the anchor residues would be this lysine and that tyrosine. Here it might be the circle amino acid and the triangle amino acid. Investigators first figured this out by taking um, two different MHC class one variants, isolating them from cells, basically just taking a protease and chopping them off the cells, and separating the peptides out, and then sequencing the peptides. And what they found was that from MHC variant class one, um, every single peptide they got out had a um, glycine at position two, a proline at position three, and a, either a leucine or an isoleucine at nine. And they found that, uh, and so they called those three the anchor residues of MHC variant one. They found that in uh, MHC variant two, there was always a tyrosine at position two, and an isoleucine or valine at position nine. They called those the anchor residues of variant number two. Um, and so you can find anchor residues that are going to be specific to any particular MHC type that you are so interested in. Just so you know, this experiment that is shown here was actually a year-long project done by two German undergraduates um, while they were undergraduates. Um, so this is just, again, showing you um, the idea of anchor residues. So typically, um, you'll have in some class one, perhaps leucine or methionine at position two, valine at position six, valine or leucine at position nine. Any peptide with those specific amino acids will bind, and we'll see variation in the other amino acids that will uh, influence which T cell actually interacts. And here you can see two different groups of peptides that could bind to either K of B or K of D. They all have, of course, their anchor residue in common, and then the rest of the peptides vary to stimulate different T cells. MHC class one also is special in terms of where it gets peptides from. So we're looking at eight to 10 amino acid peptides, and we are specifically looking at eight to 10 amino acid peptides that come from the cytoplasm of the infected cell. So here you can see we've got proteins being made on ribosomes in the cytoplasm that will eventually end up on MHC class one and get presented on the cell's surface. If you were to think about a pathogen that is making its proteins in the cytoplasm, what pathogen might you think of? What type of pathogen might you think of? Yes, Marina. A virus. So a virus is going to be making peptides in the cytoplasm. And in fact, most commonly, class one is going to be presenting viral peptides, though again, it doesn't always have to be that way. It's really cytoplasmic. Um, 
typically if I in a problem am like, you're going to combat blah, blah, blah virus, I want it on MHC class one. Um, so, yes, Nadia? It has to be pathogenic? No. It does not have to be pathogenic. Great question. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going there. <laughs> but it does not have to be pathogenic. Um, it's, but it's just a peptide that's from the cytoplasm. Um, so if you have a cell that is infected with a virus, what is the best thing to do about that cell? How are you going to combat this infection? Yes, Molly? Kill it. You're going to kill the cell. We've talked about a few times there's not a way to like de-virus a cell. You, kind of, you just have to kill that cell and not let it act as a um, factory for making more virus. And this is actually really important. I'm going to come back to this in a second. One thing that's a little, that will make us a little sad later on is that actually if you look at the affinity between a T cell receptor and an MHC molecule, it's not the strongest. <laughs> there are many other biochemical interactions, um, like antibodies, adhesion molecules, and growth factor receptors um, that are way stronger than T cell receptors, who have quite a weak interaction. As a result, whenever we see MHC interacting with T cell receptors, there are some partner proteins that are helping hold the cells together. We're going to see a lot of them later in the semester. Today, we're only going to see one. Well, two, but you'll see. Um, but later on, we're going to see tons of them. And understanding those proteins and exactly what they do and how they signal and how that impacts the T cell is pretty important. And in fact, um, a therapy based on blocking some of those additional accessory proteins that allow for T cell interactions won the Nobel Prize this morning. Um, those proteins we're getting to, not today, but they actually are part of this um, additional T cell interaction complex. Um, in the case of MHC class one, there is a specific partner protein that is always used. The partner protein that always helps MHC class one bind to TCR, here you can see MHC class one, it's got its peptide, it's got beta 2M, it's binding to a TCR, but there's also this additional stabilizing protein called CD8. CD8 binds to um, a part on the alpha-3 locus or alpha-3 domain of uh, the heavy chain of MHC class 1. That part is super conserved, so you only need to have one kind of CD3. It can bind to all of your MHC class 1s and stabilize the interaction between the T cell receptor and the MHC class 1 molecule. So MHC class 1 always interacts with CD8. As a result, MHC class 1 always turns on CD8 T cells. So MHC class 1 plus peptide is specifically the antigen for a CD8 positive T cell. A CD8 positive T cell is looking at uh, peptides that are coming from the cytoplasm. Those peptides are bound on class 1. The CD8 T cell is going to be binding. And guess what? If you were going to guess, Molly, what do you think CD8 T cells do? Kill stuff. So these are the killer T cells. So this goes together. We have a cytoplasmic antigen. It's probably viral. Probably the best way to get rid of this cytoplasmic peptide is to kill the cell. We present it on class 1. Class 1 needs CD8 binding. And so we get a killer T cell brought in to act on this protein. So this gives us one other thing to think about. Which cells of your body could be infected by a virus? Yes, Jordan. All but one. Um, so which cells of your body do you think need to be able to do this MHC class 1 business? All of them except that one. 
And in fact, that is true. So we can also look to see which cells have MHC class 1 on their surface. And the answer is all nucleated cells have MHC class 1 on their surface. The only cells that don't are red blood cells. Because red blood cells don't have a nucleus, they're kind of useless for a virus. So every nucleated cell of your body has MHC class 1 on its surface. Right now, every single cell of your body, that's not a red blood cell, every nucleated cell of your body has six MHC class 1 proteins on its surface. Your A from your mom, your A from your dad, your B from your mom, your B from your dad, your C from your mom, your C from your dad. Right now, 24 seven. Um, so basically, all of your cells have this whole MHC class 1 business going on. Alternatively, we have MHC class 2. MHC class 2 is encoded by the MHC class 2 region of the chromosome. One of the first things that you can notice is that in both mouse and in humans, for each of our MHC class 2s that we see, you can see that there's this division into an alpha and a beta. We can see that with MHC class 2 as well. With MHC class 2, each MHC class 2 is made of an alpha and a beta. Sometimes people talk about them as a heavy chain and a light chain, but they're actually a pretty similar size-wise. And so both of those are encoded in that MHC region, both the alpha and the beta, and they go together. You can see that alpha 2 and beta 2 each have transmembrane domains. And they are each immunoglobulin domains. And then we have the alpha 1 and beta 1 domains that do not have the immunoglobulin domain structure. Alpha 1 and beta 1 come together to make that peptide binding groove, which still has two different uh, alpha helices that are kind of sitting on a platform of a beta sheet. One thing I didn't tell you about MHC class 1, but you might be able to realize it from my drawing is that we have this non-covalently attached section on beta 2M. And in fact, there is some on and off rate for beta 2M. Um, so this is a stable molecule when you have all of these three parts together, but there is a little bit of on and off rate. MHC class 2 is exceptionally stable. You will care a lot about this on Friday. MHC class 2 is actually SDS stable. So SDS does not denature MHC class 2 plus peptide. Um, once you have MHC class 2 with its bound peptide, kind of nothing's breaking that up. Um, and so we can see uh, this structure. Again, we can pivot and look at the MHC class 2 binding cleft. You can see that the binding cleft is made of the alpha 1 and beta 1 um, alpha helices. But what you also, I hope, can notice is that the ends are open in this case. The peptide can go all the way to the end. It isn't cut off. In fact, sometimes the peptide in MHC class 2 can look like a hot dog in a hot dog bun and be like hanging off the edges. And there are some immunology textbooks that at this point of the textbook have a picture of a hot dog, as if you don't know what one looks like. <laughs> um, so the peptide actually can hang out the edges of this MHC. And so MHC class 2 is not nearly as strict in terms of the length of a peptide that it will present. We often talk about the class 2 epitopes as being about 10 to 20 amino acids. Um, but in fact, they can vary even outside of that. So we're getting different subunits making up the binding cleft. We are seeing um, very big differences in the uh, size of that binding cleft. You can also imagine that since the edges are open, there isn't some nice negatively charged region to bind the amino terminus and some nice positively charged region to bind the carboxy terminus because they're off the edge flapping. The other thing that's really important with MHC class 2 is that the MHC class 2 molecule is largely not making contact with the R groups of the peptide. Instead, the MHC class 2 molecule is largely making contact 
with the main chain or backbone atoms. So here we can see that we're getting contacts with this backbone, this yellow and black backbone, and not with the R groups. Given that, do you expect that we can find anchor residues in MHC class two epitope peptides? What do you think, Christina? I see your head shake. No, why no? Because it's not gonna interact with the R groups. And so sometimes people try really hard to find anchor residues. And so here you can see that all of the peptides that came from this MHC type had a L or an F or an I kind of near the beginning, but it's not even at the same position because here it's position seven and here it's position four. And those are pretty broad amino acids. And sometimes you can like kind of stretch it to try to make it seem like there's an anchor residue, but really there are no classic anchor residues. With class one, you can put your protein into a prediction program and say, tell me all of the peptides that are gonna be bound by H HLA-A1 and it'll be like, Boop! and it'll spit it out for you. With class two, you never can predict. You, it's, something's going to bind, but you don't really ever know what. Uh, MHC class two also differs from MHC class one in terms of where it gets its peptides. So class one gets peptides from the cytoplasm. Class two, however, is getting its peptides from the endocytic pathway. So from the pathway of doing endocytosis or phagocytosis. So this could be like a B cell internalizing antigen by endocytosis, or this could be a phagocyte like our macrophage performing phagocytosis. That's where that uh, epitope peptide for the MHC is coming from. Again, we need a partner protein to stabilize the interaction between the MHC plus peptide and TCR. Here you can see your MHC class two molecule with its peptide. You can notice that we've got two transmembrane domains. You could imagine how things I might ask you to be drawing differently on MHC class two versus MHC class one. You can see the interaction with the T cell receptor. And in the case of MHC class two, the partner protein that's coming in to help stabilize the interaction is CD4 and not CD8. And CD4, again, is binding to um, the uh, domain that's here to actually stabilize the interaction. Yeah, Nadia. Uh-huh. Officially, <laughs> CD4, CD8 is part of an induced proximity model. <laughs> and so if the T cell receptor is here, it is going to potentially bind to MHC. CD4 or CD8 is diffusing separately in the membrane, but because it also has a binding site for MHC, it will get pulled into proximity of the MHC molecule. And so it's an induced proximity thing where the T cell receptor um, will have good affinity to MHC plus peptide. CD4 will also have good affinity to the MHC molecule and will be brought into induced proximity. What you might guess from that answer is that signal transduction is eventually going to happen because of induced proximity. Yeah, Christina. Do, so based on lab three, where you did flow cytometry, what do you think? What do you think? In development in the thymus, they have both. When they get to the periphery, they have one or the other. So we will see that as we go forward. Uh, great question. So CD4 uh, T cells act differently than CD8 T cells. CD8 T cells were the killer T cells. And we killed things that had antigenic peptide in the cytoplasm. CD4 T cells are going to be our helper T cells. They're going to produce cytokines for other cells. Um, this is going to be as a result of them obtaining some kind of peptide in an endocytic vesicle or phagocytic vesicle. It's gonna to bind to class two. We're gonna turn on that CD4 cell. The CD4 cell is now going to produce cytokines and be its helper T cell self. Um, so, which cells of your body do you think should be able to do this class two business? Phagosomes. 
Okay, phagosomes are an organelle. Uh, any cell that can form phagocyte. Yeah, phagocyte. 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 Yeah, Molly. All right, so neutrophils, macrophages. Other thoughts? Yep, Kale. You saw a B cell on a previous slide, so that might give you a hint that B cells are involved. Anything else? So it turns out that there are three kinds of cells that do MHC class two presentation frequently. These three kinds of cells together are known as the professional antigen presenting cells. And you were close in naming them, but not quite all the way there. So the professional antigen presenting cells are dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. Remember how I told you guys before that neutrophils were kind of the poor man's macrophage? <laughs> they were the macrophage didn't know how to do so many things. One of the things they don't know how to do is they don't know how to do class two. The macrophage can do class two presentation, turn on an adaptive immune response, the neutrophil can't, doesn't have this ability. So the only cells that we really think about as doing MHC class two presentation are dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. Those are the four or the three professional antigen presenting cells. And so every cell of your body has class one on its surface. Your macrophages have class one and class two on their surface, as do your B cells, as do your dendritic cells. One thing that you will also notice here is that your textbook does list a few types of non-professional um, antigen presenting cells. Some of them vary a little bit from species to species. So I don't want us to get super hung up on them, but there's one I want you to notice of the non-professional antigen presenting cells. One type of cell that can do MHC class two presentation that's not a professional antigen presenting cell is a thymic epithelial cell, a cell of the thymus. This is going to be really important as we have T cell development. You need some MHC class two in, in the thymus to make sure T cell development works out correctly. So we do have cells in the thymus that are able to present MHC class two in order to support T cell development. Those are the thymic epithelial cells, or as we will lovingly call them later, the TEX. So here you can actually see a very useful from your textbook compare and contrast of MHC class one versus MHC class two. So in class one, the peptide binding domain is made of the alpha one, alpha two domains, whereas in class two, it's made of the alpha one, beta one domains. Um, class one was closed at both ends, class two is open at both ends. Class one is very strictly eight to 10. Um, class two, you can see here they're saying 13 to 18. Sometimes you can see 10 to 20. Obviously, there's a lot more variation here. Um, and you can also see information about anchor residues here. So this should be a hopefully a useful summary. The other summary comes from another textbook that just also will show you. Here's the structure of both of them. This one you can see has a heavy chain and a non-covalently attached light chain that doesn't have a transmembrane domain. You can see the bound peptides. Here you've got two equivalently side chains. All nucleated cells have class one. Dendritic cells, macrophages, uh, B cells have class two. Um, class one presents to CD8s. Class two prevent, presents to CD4s. Class one presents cytosolic peptides. Class two presents endosomal peptides. So the next piece of this, the piece that we're going to move into for the rest of this week is really an in-depth description of this or of this, Ooh, this one, of how we go from a peptide being in the cell, how that peptide gets degraded, how that peptide gets loaded onto MHC, how it finds MHC, and how it gets displayed on the surface of the cell. And that process is going to be different for class one and for class two. There's going to be a fair amount of cell biology involved in this process. So we're gonna be hitting a whole bunch of cell biology at the secretory pathway, 
um, I don't know what Dunaway calls it. Sometimes people call it the secretory pathway. Sometimes people call it the biosynthetic secretory pathway. Sometimes people call it the endocytic pathway. Whichever of those pathways you have heard of, um, we are going to see in great detail <laughs> over the next two days this week. Um, so that may be something that you may want to refresh your memory on as we're going to see quite a bit of it um, over the next couple days.